Hey, what's going on everybody? Justin here and welcome back to another Lazy Sunday book review. And in this video, what we're going to be going over is a new release in the field of ancient Greek history. And it is Paul Cartledge's Thebes, the Forgotten City of Ancient Greece. And Paul Cartledge is a pretty prominent, popular, popular historian. Um, he's written a couple books on Sparta. He's got the Spartans and Thermopylae, which I read quite a while ago, actually. I don't even remember how many years ago that was. Um, he also has one of the very short introductions here on his just ancient Greece number 286 right there and I've read a couple of his works um and like I said he's pretty uh pretty pretty well known in the field of classical and ancient Greek history so when I heard that Thebes was coming out um I definitely had to request it so a big thank you to Abrams Press uh for sending me this title Thebes is my favorite Greek city-state, my favorite place, except maybe Massalia. I don't know, it's a toss-up It's a toss -up between Thebes and Massalia, but since even less people have heard of uh, Massalia, then, you know, I kind of just go with Thebes. But anyways, uh, Thebes gets a really bad rap in general, and that's largely um, because they Medized during the Greek Greco-Persian Wars, uh, which the author points out. Um, however, the author also points out, you know, pretty much all the other city-states uh, north of the Hot Gates, north of... Um, the Isthmus of Corinth and stuff really didn't have much of a choice but to, to meet ice because a lot of the the the, uh, the anti-Persian alliance essentially was not willing to go that far north and make a stand up there, um, especially uh, during the first or uh, during the invasion uh, of four eighty. So essentially, you know, everyone such as Thebes was essentially left to their own devices and you know obviously most of them are just kind of kind of defect rather than be completely annihilated uh, to the person so whether that's fair or not that you know his, the ancient sources and even like some of the modern writers kind of you know always bring up that the fact that Thebes medized and blah de blah you know probably isn't really the, the fairest of statements uh but partially that is part of the reason I think Thebes has never really like kind of gained a whole lot of traction um in ancient Greek pop history popularity, uh, but Thebes is definitely sort of one of the three three points of the the major triangle of like um, like mainland Greek uh, power. Obviously, we got Sparta, Athens, and Thebes. I think forms like kind of the other um, point in kind of like in the north. Uh, Sparta being in the Peloponnese. Obviously, Athens kind of by, on the coast in the middle, and then Thebes in sort of the Boeotian Highlands and whatnot. Uh, but anyways. Uh, Sparta and Athens definitely overall kind of run the show when it comes to Greek history and kind of like overshadow everything else. Uh, whether that's fair or not, probably not only because both of those states are very goofy in terms of being sort of outliers on how like Greek city states really actually like functioned, it seems. Um, Athens obviously being like, you know, the uber, uh, like uber just like fully fledged um, super democracy uh, slash demagoguery and Sparta being sort of the weird retro dual monarchy having the whole like hella class slave system so they can have a standing military it was also like a pretty much an extreme outlier as well for greek police um and they sort of overshadow pretty much everything and kind of run the terms on like you know what ancient greek history is so it's really cool seeing like another history focused on another city state um the beginning of the book uh, the first section of the book kind of deals with sort of the prehistory, proto-history, and mythical history of Thebes, which I think is really neat. Um, obviously, with sort of the prehistory stuff, it's sort of the Mycenaean um, uh, Bronze Age sort of history. I think that was actually pretty cool. I didn't realize how old, just how old uh, Thebes um, really was. So it's kind of interesting learning just, you know, uh, how far back the physical structures of Thebes and stuff uh, really went. And then sort of dealing with the mythical history, we have, like, for example, on the cover here, we have Oedipus. Uh, dueling with the Sphinx over riddles and whatnot. Oedipus being sort of not necessarily the founder of Thebes per se, which is actually interesting because the, the founder of Thebes um, was actually not a Greek, a Greek even in the, the mythical retelling, so that's actually really interesting. But Oedipus sort of being like almost like the founding father of Thebes, if you could uh, uh, call it that, whereas like, for example, Athens has uh, Theseus. Uh, Thebes is equivalent. He's essentially a uh, wise king, Oedipus. Um, and so we kind of deal with sort of the mythical uh, sort of stuff as well. And then we go into the sort of classical um, age of history of, well, classical age of, you know, Greek history from like the Greco-Persian Wars uh, down uh, to the fall of Thebes, which we'll uh, get to in a minute because one of those sections in the 4th century BCE is definitely my favorite uh, period sort of in Greek history. And it's sort of why I really, really enjoy 
uh, thieves, but we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, it was kind of interesting in learning about the Pentaconta Etia, which is sort of the period in between the Peloponnese, the 50 year period between the uh, Greco Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian War. Um, not a whole lot has come to us uh, uh, about sort of Thebes' actual like kind of history. It's very dark and murky, uh, kind of trying to extrapolate sort of what was going on with Thebes. And, and what you find out is pretty interesting in the sense of how Thebes was politically run is uh, there is Boeotia and then there's Thebes. Um, and Boeotia is sort of a conglomeration of about 20 or so uh, nearby uh, fairly related city-states um, with Thebes and a couple others being very dominant in this sort of uh, grouping known as Boeotia. Um, and depending on sort of outside events and the ebb and flow of, you know, politics and, you know, the waxing and waning of the strength of Thebes and whatnot, um, Thebes can actually sort of just dominate this whole, like, federal structure. Um, and then sometimes with Thebes, for example, after, like, a defeat and stuff, um, sort of, they get subsumed under kind of just, like, the Boeotia and uh, federal, like, existence. So I think that's actually really neat, sort of how a bunch of little city-states are always kind of like I said, they're always pretty much part of Thebes, but they're still distinct and different. So I thought that was um, uh, pretty neat. Uh, and then we kind of get on to like the Peloponnesian War and whatnot. And I'm actually really glad this book does not fall into the trap that a lot of ancient Greek histories uh, do. And that is basically getting like completely sucked into the Peloponnesian War and just drag on and on and on. Um, even books that aren't on the Peloponnesian War, if they're more like general books and whatnot. I always find that since there's such a pretty good, rich... Um, history of source material with the Peloponnesian War, um, that tends to be a topic that just goes on forever in a lot of Greek histories, even if the books are not even really ostensibly about, like, the Peloponnesian, excuse me, Peloponnesian War or military matters or anything. Um, there's just, it always just seems to take up a big portion of a lot of books, and I'm glad that this book does not fall into uh, that trap. Obviously, the Peloponnesian War is dealt with, um, basically because, you know, Thebes is a very important, um, uh, police with a very prominent land army, um, and it's part of the kind of the, the, you know, the Spartan, a lot, the Spartan, you know, the Peloponnesian League, which, you know, the author points out really, is it Peloponnesian or is it really a league and stuff? Um, but anyways, uh, like I said, Peloponnesian War doesn't take up an overly large portion of the book. So I was very uh, pleased with that. And then we enter kind of the history, the, the era of history that really stands out, especially for Thebes, um, is why I really enjoy, uh, you know, the Theban police. Uh, during kind of the mid 4th century CE, uh, I guess like later 3rd or something like that, I guess you'd say, um, uh, two leaders in Thebes uh, really come to prominence, and that's Epaminondas, who's probably my favorite ancient Greek figure of all time, um, and Pilopitis. And they kind of like reform, um, have a, different, a couple little different uh, tweaks and stuff that they do with Thebes, and essentially um, Thebes is able to become hegemon of the Greek world, which is essentially kind of like the leading city-state of their kind of respective kind of sphere of influence. Um, and during the battles of Leuctra and uh, Manten uh, Second Mantineo, Thebes really pretty much crushes Sparta. And after the first battle of Leuctra, uh, Spartan power is pretty much broken forever. It was already way on the decline, um, but Epimenides and Thebes is able to sort of shut, just completely shatter the mirage of Spartan, like, you know, invincibility and whatnot, and basically show, you know, they're not really all they're cracked up to be uh, anymore. Uh, during the Battle of Lutra, you know, a third, roughly a third of the Spartan army, uh, the actual Spartiates, but just the actual Spartan population, the full citizen population, which is already on the decline, is cut by about a third, um, at least uh, the male, the male citizenship is cut into, or, uh, <laughs> About a third is killed is what I'm trying to say um, uh, during the Battle of Lutra, including uh, uh, one of the two uh, Spartan Kings. I think it was uh, Cleobrotus, if I remember correctly. And um, obviously, kind of dealing with that, Spartan power is very much broken. And Thebes um, and sort of uh, their alliance is able to kind of go into the Peloponnese, rescue and free um, a majority of the Messenians and the Helots, um, help them establish their own city-states, uh, Megalopolis uh, at Mount Ithome. Uh, which was their traditional sort of homeland, uh, right in Sparta's backyard. And so kind of with this like one, two blow, uh, Spartan military power is completely broken. And then also um, a lot of their sort of way of life, since you know, the only reason they're able to like have a full-time professional army that does nothing but train and fight is because they have, you know, this entire slave class of the helots, um, essentially doing like, you know, all the late labor and field work and agricultural labor uh, for them. But if a lot of them are freed, you know, they kind of like, kind of run, 
just screws up with the sort of uh, balance of power in the uh, Spartan state. So I thought that's sort of kind of why I really like Epaminondas and uh, like the Theban hegemony and whatnot. Just because the like Sparta, I I just think Sparta is like super overrated and kind of you know just kind of grind, grind them under heel a little bit. Um, and then at the second battle of Mantinea, even though both sides sort of claimed victory, um, it definitely was at least like a tactical victory for Thebes. Uh, unfortunately, Epaminondas. Um, was killed in the fighting as well, and that sort of begins that kind of the period, the, the quick period of decline um, for uh, Theban hegemony and Theban power, uh, because soon after Philip and Alexander sort of come to town, and obviously with the Battle of Chaeronea, uh, Philip kind of destroys uh, the forces of Thebes and Athens who try to stand up to him, and then afterwards Thebes kind of pushing a little bit too much, and Alexander sort of uh, destroys Thebes. <laughs> So that's sort of the end of Thebes as its own kind of independent uh, city-state. I will say one thing, one little qualm with the book that I wish um, it dealt with a little bit more during the, this sort of era was, uh, for example, uh, during the Battle of Lutra and Mantinea, uh, there is uh, a unit in Thebes that's created known as the Sacred Band, and all that, not too much has come down to us, uh, though the sources say it was comprised of 150 pairs of male lovers, um, kind of like on the whole like Spartan ethos of, you know, if you fight um, side by side with like your partner or your lover or whatever, uh, you're going to fight more valiantly and with more courage and, you know, um, not want to fail or uh, be cowardly in front of them and whatnot. So you'll fight harder and stuff like that. Um, but obviously the sacred band is kind of very mysterious just because pretty much everything, every, a lot of things in Thebes is pretty, <laughs> pretty scarce on source material, but especially um, the sacred band. However, and reading some other books, I've read debates on whether how the sacred band was used, um, and the author does not really address this uh, uh, much in the books. However, uh, the sacred band obviously was part of these battles, and there's sort of a debate of whether is the sacred band just sort of the cu you know the cutting edge of the phalanx, like they're kind of the front front like rank or two of the phalanx, or are they sort of their own independent unit? Because I have read in some places. Uh, the evidence seems to seem to indicate that maybe they were kind of their own unit that was able to break off from the rest of the Theban phalanx because they're they're a little bit more disciplined and you know they have more training and whatnot and they're able to sort of outmaneuver and just completely flank um, the engaged Spartan phalanx as well. Uh, the author doesn't um, kind of a, doesn't even bring up this issue, um, which I thought was kind of interesting because it's a book on Thebes and this is like one of the you know this is like you know the shining moment for Thebes essentially is the battles of Lutra and Mantinea. Um, so I thought that was kind of a weird omission. But after sort of the, all this like kind of classical history and stuff, there is one more section of the book which I found pretty interesting, and it's um, sort of how uh, what how Thebes has like reverberated and come dead to us even in the modern age, whether that's with like you know an Oedipus Oedipan complex um, uh, <laughs> with like Freud and whatnot, um, as well as a lot of sort of the uh, tragedies and stuff that involve uh, Thebes, you know, with Antigone. Oedipus and stuff and how different operas and music and theater and stuff is still pretty heavily influenced uh, in some uh, in some like categories I guess uh, by a lot of like Theban mythology and stuff so I thought that was actually um, pretty interesting especially if you really enjoy high culture and whatnot but yeah I definitely encourage anyone who's interested in ancient Greek history pick up this book it's the, even if you've read a lot of ancient Greek history um, it's going to be cool just to have a new perspective, kind of like just a new like lens of looking at Greek history through the lens of Thebes, uh, rather than kind of the heavily dominated, you know, lens of Athens, which a lot of um, Greek histories uh, tend to do. Um, and like I said, if you're if you're into not liking Sparta like I am, then you'll probably really enjoy uh, this book as well, just because you know Thebes is sort of their arch enemy, like at the end of things, even though normally they were allied with Sparta for a long time, but you'll um, come to learn why uh, Thebes and Sparta uh, sort of came to blows in the 4th century BCE. But like I said, overall, really good history, very readable. Um, so like I said, a few little weird omissions that kind of sort of aren't brought up, but it's kind of a cool blend of general history along with kind of more like, like I said, kind of the legendary mythical elements kind of thrown in there as well really highly enjoyed it and i hope you will too if you end up picking it up so there you have it that was my review of thieves by paul carlidge thanks again to abrams press for sending me that release and thank you for watching don't forget to comment like subscribe all that cool stuff check out my twitter and instagram and everything like that and always remember whether you're reading about thieves or not always remember read victoriously